Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Let me uh, start with a bit of motivation for uh, this primitive. Namely, in a regular uh, encryption setting in the real world, so what we call the real world maybe, uh, so we usually uh, speak about many parties and we have many ciphertexts. That means we have a bunch of people, each with an individual public key, that may send a bunch of ciphertexts to any other uh, person in the system. So an actual adversary, again, of course it's an abstraction, but an actual adversary would get a bunch of public keys and also a bunch of ciphertexts. Um, but what we usually do when we try to construct public key encryption schemes is that we simplify things and we're saying that, okay, we really only have one user or sender or one uh, public key, and we have one challenge ciphertext. For instance, this is the case with in CPA security or in CCA security. And um, so in this setting, we have a security experiment in which the adversary gets just one ciphertext. And of course, the adversary then has to uh, make some or, or to derive some information about the information uh, about the plain text in this ciphertext, and he wins or loses uh, if he if he uh, finds out something about this particular ciphertext. And the justification why we look at this simplified setting and not at the whole deal with a bunch of public keys and a bunch of ciphertexts is that usually we can say that a hybrid argument works. What this means is that uh, if we have a one challenge setting and a one user setting, then usually we can, we can, we can argue that uh, if this is the case, then in a larger setting, uh, the, the scheme enjoys the same security properties. So even the adversary that gets many ciphertexts won't derive any information, any reasonable information about any enco en encrypted message. So um, this has several drawbacks. In particular, I want to highlight two drawbacks that this uh, view or that this simplification has. First of all, the connection to the real world is not tight. So if we have a scheme which satisfies uh, this simplified security notion, then in translating this experiment to the real world experiment, we lose a factor in the security reduction. That means our scheme gets less secure um, if we use it for more users, or it may get less secure. Of course, this, this is only a, a defect of the proof technique. This is not a defect of the scheme, or not necessarily. And the second, and this is what I really want to focus on, is the second uh, problem of this simplification is that certain settings where we have encryption schemes with specific properties, such as selective opening security, I'm going to be a bit more specific about this in a second, um, then we simply cannot restrict ourselves to a one challenge setting or one user setting, simply because uh, the usual way hybrid arguments work fails in certain settings such as selective openings. So for specific settings this is problematic and also there's a factor we lose in the security reduction if we simplify things when we analyze the security of, for, for instance, encryption schemes. So uh, just to have a brief example of this, um, the security notion for selective openings, which somehow uh, should capture uh, adaptive corruptions of senders in an, encryption, uh, in an encryption setting, is that the adversary gets a bunch of uh, ciphertexts, a whole vector of ciphertexts, in fact, and then, this is a simplified notion, selects a subset of these ciphertexts. So the adversary tells you uh, uh, a set of indices from uh, 1 to n, uh, which he wants to corrupt, or this corresponds to users he wants to corrupt. And then he gets openings of all the ciphertexts, where opening means the adversary does not only get the, the message that was encrypted, but also the randomness that was used to encrypt. So this corresponds to really an opening of a commitment uh, for all the indices that he selected. And then in the end, he should find out something, or it's, uh, the adversary's goal is to find out something, of course, about the unopened ciphertexts. The open ciphertexts, well, he knows all about them already. So uh, in this situation, the adversary gets uh, the public key, all of the ciphertexts, and the openings of some of them. And um, it turns out that um, a hybrid argument in this setting simply fails. We cannot uh, somehow argue that the scheme is secure in the one challenge case, and now um, we somehow conclude security in this multi-challenge uh, setting, so in the, if you want, in the real world. Um, the reason is that we wouldn't even know how to translate uh, or how to build a one challenge setting for, for this particular game. Okay, uh, so far uh, the motivation, why we should look at the multi-challenge, multi-user setting in, in some sense directly and not 
um, deal with simplifications in certain cases at least. So in this talk, I want to uh, present a technical tool that is specifically designed to treat situations in which you have multi, uh, if, in, if you, in which you have mul multiple challenges and multiple users, multiple public keys, uh, and you want to treat this setting, you want to tackle security proofs in this setting directly. And this is called all but many lossy trapdoor functions. And uh, also I want to look at a construction of all but many lossy trapdoor functions, which is uh, very, uh, so technically this is very close to water signatures in fact, but with a twist. Um, so let me start with a definition of a technical tool that is specifically designed for the multi-challenge, multi-user uh, case. Um, so first of all, a recap, what, what's, uh, what's a lossy trapdoor function in the first place? And from this, we will generalize then. So a lossy trapdoor function is, first of all, a, a keyed function. So it's actually a family of functions where you have an input x and you have a key, ek, evaluation key, I call it. Uh, and you can evaluate that function on x and you get some output. And uh, the, the whole point or the, uh, the, the interesting property uh, of lossy chapter functions is that you can, you can have uh, evaluation keys uh, that lead to invertible functions and you can have evaluation keys uh, that lead to lossy functions. And what this means, I'm going to tell you in a second. So the properties are uh, if you operate that function in invertible mode, which means uh, with a key which is drawn from a set of invertible keys, then you, can, uh, you, you get an injective function and in fact you can invert that function Using, suitable, uh, using a suitable trapdoor IK inversion key that was uh, sampled initially together with the evaluation key. And um, at the same time, you cannot efficiently distinguish evaluation keys which are uh, invertible from lossy keys EK prime. And uh, the nice property or the specific property that these lossy keys have is that they actually lead to a lossy function, which means the image set f e k prime, so the function operated um, in lossy mode, is much smaller than the pre-image set, so we really lose some information. Um, so we have efficient constructions of these creatures from LWE, from DDH, from DCR, um, and I want to highlight one particular construction here from DCR, so this is really a known construction, um, because it's efficient and it's the basis for what comes next. So. Um, the evaluation key in this DCR-based uh, lossy trapdoor function is the public key of a additively homomorphic encryption scheme. So this can be Damgård-Urich encryption, for example, or Payet encryption. Well, Payet, uh, it, it has to be Damgård-Urich, the generalization of Payet encryption, really. And uh, also in the evaluation key, we have a ciphertext, which is the encryption of a bit B. This can be either uh, B equals one or zero. And if we have a bit, which is uh, one, then the evaluation, which simply consists of deterministically using the homomorphic properties to uh, derive an encryption of b times x, then this becomes an encryption of x, of course, and we can, uh, we can invert the function simply by, by using the decryption key. On the other hand, in lossy mode, we have b equals zero, so if we operate that function in lossy mode and we evaluate it, we uh, get an encryption of zero all the time. Of course, we lose some information here, or we, we actually we leak some information through the encryption randomness, or if this is a deterministic thing without any re randomization, but we can upbound the amount of uh, information we leak through the encryption randomness. So essentially, um, here in lossy mode, we get an encryption of zero all the time. And this fulfills all the, the properties here, invertibility, indistinguishability, and lossiness. And indistinguishability simply follows from the fact that it's a secure encryption scheme, so under the DCR assumption. Um, so how do we use this uh, primitive to argue for the security of an, an encryption scheme? Uh, we simply, well, essentially we uh, encrypt a message by evaluating that uh, lossy trapdoor function. So because we leak some information in lossy mode um, about the pre-image, we have to do some, some, uh, um, some universal hashing or some a randomness extraction here to somehow condense the uncertainty that the adversary has, but uh, essentially we can use this function directly to encrypt messages. Um, 
So the security proof simply consists in uh, switching the uh, lossy chapter function to lossy mode, and then the adversary gets from a, from, an, from a ciphertext almost no information about the message. So the ciphertext become completely lossy, almost completely lossy. So the thing is, as soon as we have a decryption oracle here, uh, we cannot decrypt uh, or we cannot simulate the decryption oracle when we're in lossy mode. So either all uh, ciphertexts are lossy and contain no information about the message, or um, all ciphertexts are invertible, and in the invertible case, we cannot argue that the adversary learns nothing about the message. So um, if we want to prove CCA security uh, with such a technique, then um, Pycott and Waters, uh, they introduced something called all but one lossy trapdoor functions, and now we're already quite close to the, uh, to the main point of the talk. Um, and all but one lossy trapdoor function simply, simply takes an evaluation key along with a tag T. So they called it branch because they had a tree-based intuition about it, but I want to just call it more generally a tag, which additionally selects uh, a function out of a pool of functions selected by the evaluation key. And so we simply evaluate the function f e k comma t um, on uh, whatever we evaluated here with on some random pre-image. And this function becomes lossy if and only if the tag is a specific tag t star, which means the adversary in the security experiment, in the NCCA security experiment, gets a lossy ciphertext, but all the other ciphertexts that the adversary could produce for decryption queries have to be non-lossy, and we can invert them. So, um, in particular, the lossy tag corresponds to a single challenge ciphertext that the adversary gets. And in particular, this does not work with many challenge ciphertexts. So if we, if we want to take this route to achieve in CCA security, we get into trouble when we have many challenges or many users. Um, so to cope with settings such as selective opening security where we have uh, more than one lossy tag and we have more than one challenge ciphertext in particular, um, there is already a thing that is called all but n lossy trapdoor functions. And essentially it's the same thing as an all but one lossy trapdoor function, only there's a bunch of uh, lossy tags. And I want, to, uh, I want to explain or I want to highlight one um, construction that uh, Hemingway, Libé, Ostrovsky, and Vagnot gave last year at Asia Crypt, I believe. Um, and it's a generalization of the uh, lossy trapdoor function from uh, DCR. So what we have here is we have an evaluation key that contains a, a damgard uric uh, encryption public key along with the coefficients encrypted of a polynomial that has, well, it has a bunch of zeros, t1 star up to tn star. And if we evalu evaluate that function, then first of all, we uh, compute this uh, inner value here, which turns out to be an, uh, a polynomial, uh, the evaluation of the polynomial f of t, and then we multiply it by the pre-image. So we end up with an encryption of f of t times x. In particular, if t is one of t1 star up to tn star, then f will have a zero there, and we will encrypt a zero value, in which case we end up with a lossy tag, so we lose information. The function for t being one of t1 star up to tn star loses information. Um, the problem that this construction has is that the space complexity, the description of the evaluation key, uh, is linear in the number of challenges. And if you think about this for a second, then this is kind of inherent because it's uh, information theoretically uh, an encoding of all these texts, t1 star up to tn star, if you look at the evaluation key. If you just uh, find out in, with, an, with an unbounded algorithm on which uh, points this function is um, lossy, and on which points it's not, you, you just have a very compli complicated way of writing down t1 star up to tn star. So if we follow this route to having multi-challenge in CCA security or multi-challenge uh, selective opening security, then you can do that, but you end up with a large public key, essentially. So uh, the, what they proved is also that you get selective opening CCA security, um, but you have to pay a price, and the price is that you have a large public key. Um, our goal in this talk is lossy chapter functions with many lossy tags. So the intuition or the sketch of a definition is that there are many, uh, in fact, super polynomially many lossy tags, and also there are many invertible tags, and um, they're computationally indistinguishable. And if you, have, if you want to have some kind of intuition about it, an all but one lossy chapter function has exactly one lossy tag. So there's a bunch of functions, and one of them is lossy. 
all but n lossy chapter functions, there's uh, a whole lot of functions and exactly n of them are lossy. And with all but many lossy chapter functions, actually lossy functions are all over the place, but it's hard to find them. That's the point. So with a, sp uh, with a special trapdoor, you can, of course, sample lossy, uh, lossy tags here, but it's hard to find them without a special trapdoor. Okay, now um, I'm going to be a bit brief about the construction, how to derive these creatures. And the idea is that we can start with the observation that uh, there is some correspondence to blinded signatures. So this is really not blind signatures, but this is blinded or hidden or encrypted signatures. A valid signature con corresponds to a lossy tag. Even if you saw many lossy tags already, you're unable to produce another one. That should be the property we want to achieve. So let's simply encrypt signatures, because this already smells like signatures. It just doesn't have to have an efficient verification. So we sign some unique value. This can be a hash function or something. This is really not important. But the point is that we have a tag which contains an encryption of a signature. And the evaluation of this lossy trapdoor function somehow magically verifies the signature and should end up with an encryption of zero if and only if the signature is valid. And then we use the, uh, the trick from before that we simply say that the image is, um, well, x, t uh, the encryption of x times whatever uh, we start with. So if the signature is valid, we end up with an encryption of zero and we get a lossy function. If the signature is invalid, then we end up with an encryption of something, presumably, presumably not zero, and we end up with a function which we can invert by inverting d. So the problem is that how does this magically verifying a signature, how does that really work? Because we only have uh, an additively homomorphic encryption scheme. And how do we verify a signature in Zn or Zn star if we, only, if we only have addition? Now, we use two tricks in order to accomplish this. The first trick or the first idea is inspired by Pygott and Waters, the original lossy trapdoor function construction. And it's to use matrices instead of single values. So what we do is we have an, the tag contains an encrypted uh, matrix instead of an encrypted value. And if we evaluate that function, we simply use like uh, matrix vector multiplication. So we take the encrypted matrix, take a plain text vector, which is the pre-image, and we compute an encryption of m times x. This can be done using the uh, additively homomorphic properties of the encryption scheme. So the point of this is that this mapping becomes lossy if and only if the matrix is invertible. Or, it, no, sorry, if, the, if and only if the matrix is not invertible. If the matrix is invertible, then of course we can, by decrypting, using a decryption key, we can decrypt M, and we can derive uh, E of X, or we can derive X from an encryption of M times X. And why did we do this? What's the payoff here? The payoff is that uh, a matrix is lossy if and only if the determinant is invertible, or not invertible, rather. So, but the determinant is a value which can depend in a cubic way on the encrypted values. In particular, we get a bunch of multiplications all of a sudden. Uh, so the verification or the signature verification here, if we want to uh, somehow make a, uh, make a tag which magically uh, evaluates a signature verification, then this corresponds to computing the determinant, which again uh, can be uh, used to embed some multiplications. So the second idea is once we have that in mind, that we can afford a small number of multiplications, uh, we can use a variant of water signatures only in a, in a different domain. So what we do is water signatures are a, a CDH-based is, is CDH signature scheme in pairing groups, and we want to translate this to Zn. So what we do is we simply replace exponentiation by encryption. So this is, again, a Payet or damgott urig encryption, additively homomorphic, and we replace g to the a by an encryption of a. And um, now the pairing essentially becomes a uh, multiplication of exponents, or so multiplication of ciphertexts, or of the plain text values encrypted in ciphertexts. In particular, CDH becomes, uh, the computational diffie hellman assumption becomes the assumption that you cannot uh, multiply Payet ciphertexts. And this is, in fact, the computational assumption that the construction is based on. It's based on the assumption that uh, Payet is not multiplicatively, multiplicatively homomorphic, or not fully homomorphic, if you want. Um, 
So uh, if, we, if we do this and if we translate things, then what we end up with is a scheme where each tag, uh, an all but many loss chapter function scheme, where each tag uh, leads to a matrix like this, which has a determinant which exactly expresses the verification function of um, water signatures. So this is a nice thing, because if we have evaluations like this, then this can be viewed as an implicit water verification, implicit uh, verification for the signature scheme. Uh, in particular, we have a, a, a lossy function if and only if the signature was, was uh, valid. And so we can essentially take the security proof of water signatures, transport it to a different setting, and what we get is an all but many lossy chapter function. Um, okay, now the last slide will be about what we can do with this primitive now that we have such a multi-challenge, multi-user primitive. So the first thing is we can uh, derive efficient CCA secure selective opening schemes, where in particular um, n neither ciphertext nor uh, public key depend on the number of challenges. So um, also it's, it's uh, compact, but it's, well, you, you have to work with uh, dumbgott Uric encryption, so it's not exactly efficient, but it's still, uh, uh, it's still a small number of group elements. Um, and um, this is the first scheme with these properties. Then we can also get uh, tight in CCA security. So the security, this is a funny thing because the security reduction is actually tight, but the scheme itself is not really efficient. So it has a, a quadratic number in the security parameter of group elements in each ciphertext, but it uh, gives a tight and CCA secure uh, encryption scheme. Uh, okay, um, and it also has applications if we modify these, uh, these techniques a little, then we get uh, key dependent message security, which also is a setting in which there are inherently many challenge ciphertexts and you cannot easily get rid of them, or you cannot easily apply a hybrid argument. So again, there are similar concepts, but uh, we need a few tweaks. And this is upcoming, this is not in the paper. And finally, I don't know, uh, but maybe there's also an application to leakage resilience because also there you have a bunch of, inherently a bunch of ciphertexts, uh, of challenge ciphertexts you cannot easily get rid of. Okay, that was all, thanks. Thank you.